In 1859, as America was rushing towards civil war, James Parton, the first historian to attempt a biography of Andrew Jackson, arrived at the Hermitage, Jackson's beloved home. He was escorted through the mansion by Hannah Jackson, who had been Andrew Jackson's slave from the time she was 10 until Jackson died. Parton knew that many Americans considered Andrew Jackson the country's greatest leader since the Founding Fathers. Parton wrote, During the last 30 years of his life, he was the idol of the American people. Columbus had sailed. Washington fought. Jefferson written. Fifty years of democratic government had passed. And the result of it all was that the people of the United States honored Andrew Jackson before all other living men. Andrew Jackson, in my mind, is one of the great presidents. And it's not surprising that he was so loved. In fact, it is said that when the Civil War broke out in 1861, people wanted to vote for Andrew Jackson, hoping he would come back and save the Union. He was that beloved. For all of his flaws, for all of his contradictions, Andrew Jackson did more than any other American of his generation to enlarge the possibilities of American democracy. In doing that, in seeing himself as president, as the tribune of the people, he did more than anyone to change to enlarge the possibilities of the American presidency. But Jackson was also one of the most controversial presidents in American history. His policies on issues like Indian removal and slavery provoked fierce opposition, not only in his lifetime, but beyond. Andrew Jackson for African Americans is not the sort of figure uh, that one holds very dear. He wouldn't form part of the, the ranks of the great men uh, of American society because never in his reign as president, in his terms as president, did he ever attempt to expand the rights of people. On the contrary, he did everything he could, it seems to me, to constrict those rights, to limit those rights. People talk about Andrew Jackson's black moods. People talk about Andrew Jackson's red-hot temper. But the color of this story is green, and it's the green of envy, and it's the green of coveting Indian lands. At the Hermitage, Parton discovered a portrait of Jackson finished just before he died. It was completely unlike the many heroic portraits of the great man and the vulnerability it captured brought to life Parton's most insightful description of Jackson. He was a democratic autocrat, an urbane savage, an atrocious saint. Americans have always looked at Andrew Jackson and seen themselves. But over the years, they've looked at Andrew Jackson and seen different versions of themselves. At one time, they saw the frontiersman, the poor boy made good, the classic self-made man. Today, some Americans look back at Jackson and they see the slaveholder, the Indian oppressor, even the Indian hater. So the debate about Andrew Jackson is a very contemporary one. He's an inescapable, quintessential American, but of what kind? Uh, is he a man whom we should admire, or is he a man whom we should despise? Is he a man whom we should celebrate, or is he a man for whom we should apologize? Thomas Jefferson. He could never speak on account of the rashness of his feelings. I have seen him attempt it repeatedly, and as often, choke with rage. Okay, gang, so our plan today is to start looking at the rise of Jacksonian democracy and how that's going to redefine American politics for the next several decades. It's important to go back to the intro to Unit 3 
where we talked about this era of good feelings that's really going to define James Monroe's presidency in the 1816 to 1824. Um, we talked about the fact that the Federalist Party had died off after the Hartford Convention, and there was only one party left. And that lasted through Monroe's presidency. But even then, um, there are definite signs that the era of good feelings was going to come to an end. The Panic of 1819 brought about sectional tensions between East and West, particularly over the National Bank. Jackson will be poised to be an opponent of the bank as a result of that. The Missouri Compromise will begin the debate over slavery that will really take off over the course of the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. And then finally, the corrupt bargain of 1824, a disputed election uh, in 1824, will really bring about the end of the era of good feelings, the split of the Democratic or Republican Party into factions, and a redefinition of a party system that will take place in the course of the next decade. So we'll pick up there. We're going to watch some video clips from a film called Andrew Jackson, Good, Evil, and the Presidency. It is narrated by my favorite president, Jeb Bartlett of the West Wing, otherwise known as Martin Sheen. And we'll pick up in 1824 and look at how the campaign of 1824 broke down and how it's going to set the stage for a very tumultuous election in 1828. Henry Clay. I failed to see how the killing of 2,000 English persons at New Orleans qualifies a person for the difficult and complicated duties of the presidency. In 1824, James Monroe was retiring after two terms as president. Andrew Jackson thought he was an excellent candidate to be the next occupant of the White House, but he was not the only one with his eye on the job. John Quincy Adams was the son of John Adams, America's second president. He had spent much of his childhood in Europe with his father and was now Secretary of State. His worldview was as different from Jackson's as his upbringing. He was a politician with imagination. He imagined an America that was much more economically developed. He imagined an America with much broader uh, uh, educational opportunities for everybody. He imagined an America in which the rights of Indians and black people and women were actually respected. Treasury Secretary William Crawford and Speaker of the House Henry Clay were also candidates for president. As in every previous election, the candidates did not campaign. And in some states, residents did not even get to vote for president. Instead, the state legislature chose that state's members of the Electoral College. In the early years of the Republic, voters were not called on to choose the President of the United States. Choosing the President was uh, quite honestly and quite deliberately an elitist operation. Uh, the people who were thought to be the insiders in state government became the presidential electors and they chose the president based on which set of Washington insiders they thought was the best. And the people were basically expected to accept that decision without complaint. In an election controlled by Washington politicians, the frontiersman from Tennessee seemed certain to finish last. When Andrew Jackson's name was first floated about as a candidate for the presidency, all kinds of leading politicians were aghast. Uh, they understood him to be a wild-eyed military chieftain, uh, a hot-tempered individual who had executed a couple of Brits down in Florida without uh, authority or, uh, or apparent reason. Uh, and, as Jefferson said, he was the most unfit man imaginable for the office of the presidency. To counter the view that Jackson was unfit to be president, one of his advisors, John Eaton, published a series of letters that proposed an entirely new rationale for what was important in a president. In the selection of a chief magistrate of this union, it is not necessary that we should look exclusively to the mental qualifications of a candidate. 
It is strength of character, a perseverance and steadiness of purpose that makes the distinguished man. What John Eaton does in the Letters of Wyoming is simply stand on its head the conventional understanding of the qualifications of a president. The very qualities that made a candidate before, John Quincy Adams being the, the ideal, experience in courts of Europe, experience in diplomacy, experience as his father's secretary in, the, in various offices of government, all of this is proof of corruption, proof of insider status, proof of being out of touch with the people. Whereas Jackson's complete absence of a resume becomes his primary qualification for office. When the votes were counted in 1824, the Washington establishment was stunned to discover that Andrew Jackson had won both the most popular and electoral votes. But with four men dividing up the electoral vote, Jackson did not win a majority, and the election was thrown into the House of Representatives. Speaker of the House Henry Clay had finished last and was out of the running. But he had enough support to play kingmaker. Clay believed with all of his heart that Andrew Jackson was unfit to be president, so he threw his support to John Quincy Adams, and with it, Adams was elected president. Adams then immediately offered Clay the job of Secretary of State. Outraged Jackson supporters began railing against what they were convinced was a corrupt bargain between Washington insiders to steal the presidency from Andrew Jackson. One newspaper which had endorsed Jackson declared, Expired at Washington on the 9th of February, 1825, the virtue, liberty, and independence of the United States, caused by poison administered by the assassin hand of John Quincy Adams, the usurper, and Henry Clay. What they were absolutely convinced of was that the popular will had been thwarted, the election had been stolen, Washington insiders had uh, cooked up the whole thing, and they had to make sure it didn't happen again. By 1828, when Andrew Jackson ran against John Quincy Adams a second time, the Jacksonians were ready to launch the first true political campaign in American history. Their strategy was driven by the fact that most states had finally given the vote to all white males. To inspire those men to get out and vote for the first time in their lives, Jackson's campaign took advantage of the latest media revolution, lithography, to flood America with lithographs of the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. If you're going to elect the president by appealing to the people as a whole, you change the ground rules completely because you have to win the popular vote down there at the grassroots, at the militia grounds, in the taverns, in the fairs, in the streets, all across the country. So somehow you have to be able to reach those people. You've got to fire them up. The Jacksonians' plan was to rally average Americans around a new idea, that they should choose the president of the United States. So they organized all kinds of popular demonstrations, rallies, conventions, assemblies of people who would get together and hurrah for Jackson. They would pass some set of resolutions and then they would all have a barbecue and they would all have a drink and they would start to cheer and pretty soon you'd get the sense that everybody in this precinct is for Jackson and they'd send the results of that to the newspaper and uh, try to publicize it as much as they could. And this was the kind of tactic that didn't require finagling behind closed doors. It could take place in the boondocks. It could happen in rural Tennessee, rural Alabama. Rural New York. In 
And this kind of uh, stirring up popular vote and giving the people the notion that they should choose the president and not the uh, caucus members in Washington, that revolutionized American politics. The people have not been willing to give up the choice of president ever since. The revolutionary new style of campaigning soon made Jackson into the heavy favorite. But then his opponents discovered the skeleton inside Andrew and Rachel's closet. The man behind the mischief was a confidant of Henry Clay's, who edited a Cincinnati newspaper. He uncovered and printed the court record of Rachel Jackson's divorce proceedings, which revealed that Rachel had lived with Andrew while she was married to another man. The story of Rachel's adultery was soon on the front pages of newspapers across the country. Jackson is called the Western Bluebeard. Rachel is the American Jezebel. And it's said, the touch of a profligate woman like Rachel is going to pollute anyone. How can someone like this be put in the White House and over the women in Washington society? Jackson blamed Henry Clay for the attacks on Rachel, and he would later say that it was one of the great regrets of his life that he did not shoot Clay. Instead, Jackson's campaign fired back with the charge that while Adams was U.S. envoy to Russia, he had procured an American whore for the Russian czar. This and other stories they told about Adams were lies, whereas the story that the Adams people were telling about Jackson was true, uh, but taken together, uh, they all made the campaign of 1828, quite possibly, the dirtiest campaign in all American history. The viciousness of the campaign would have consequences no one could have foreseen. Rachel was now 57 and had become deeply religious. She found it impossible to accept that people across America were now publicly calling her a whore and worse. Just because she had fallen in love with Andrew Jackson so many years ago. To a friend, she wrote, Who has been so cruelly tried as I have? Our enemies have dipped their arrows in wormwood and gall and sped them at me. Almighty God, was there ever anything to equal it? To think that 30 years have passed. I've come to see Rachel Jackson's life as the plot of a grand opera. You have a young woman who makes a mistake in her first marriage and then chooses to escape that with a very courageous protector. But by doing that, she's made perhaps the biggest mistake of her life because this whole story of Rachel as a fallen woman explodes on the scene again and becomes the moral wedge issue of the 1820 campaigns. When the election of 1828 was over and the votes were counted, Andrew Jackson, the war hero who had dramatically expanded America, was elected president in a landslide. In January of 1829, he boarded a steamboat to begin his journey from Nashville to Washington, D.C. At many stops along the way, the townsfolk planned joyous celebrations to honor the first man of humble origins to become president. But Andrew Jackson declined every single invitation he received, for he was too bowed down with grief. Just after the election, Rachel Jackson had died of a heart attack. 
Jackson was devastated by Rachel's death. From that day forward, he carried her miniature and would speak to Rachel every night before his, he went to sleep, whether he was at the Hermitage or in Washington. And when he was home at the Hermitage, each evening he would go and visit Rachel's grave. And yet, Rachel's death was seen by some as a political godsend for Jackson. Everyone around Jackson knows Rachel is going to be a problem in the White House because the women in Washington will not accept her socially. And Rachel choosing, shall we say, to die at that moment frees him to focus on all the challenges he'll have in the White House. And in many ways, she's like Madame Butterfly who realizes that she, it's only through her death that she'll be able to give her lover what he needs. But that was not how Andrew Jackson saw it. In his eyes, his enemies had made an unforgivable attack on his wife. He blamed John Quincy Adams for not putting a stop to it, and he blamed Henry Clay for initiating it. Jackson actually believed that they killed her. And so, as far as he was concerned, they were her murderers. Over the next eight years, Jackson's anger at his enemies would combine with his passionate personality and strong convictions to produce one of the most turbulent presidencies America has ever experienced. Before we go further, it's worth taking some time to look at the role that women played in Washington, D.C. politics. We've talked about Republican motherhood before, but it's also important to remember that there was such a thing as the Republican wife. Um, in the time period beginning with George Washington, it was considered unseemly for candidates to pursue office for their own personal gain. Candidates, therefore, did not campaign for office. They tended to say that they would serve if they were chosen. And so therefore, it was left often to the wives of these candidates to do the background networking to make sure the Electoral College was taken care of and to make sure that political supporters were aligned the correct way. Dolly Madison, who you see in the, in the top of this slide here, was very good at this, as was Louisa Adams. In fact, there are some, who people, said, some people who say that the 1824 campaign was Louisa's campaign. And so the women played a large role in helping organized politics. It's also worth mentioning the landscape of DC politics as well. If you were a member of Congress, this is still true now, if you worked in DC, you had to maintain a residence in your home state as well. So to save money, a lot of these guys are going to live in boarding houses, often with other people from their state or their party. That meant that you know they were in Congress with these guys, they were outside of Congress with these guys. It made it really hard for them to have you know, compromising conversations or not to the party line all the time. And so the women of DC often provided that kind of space, the salons, the drawing rooms of DC society, the social gatherings, that was where you would find opportunities to meet with people outside of Congress and make negotiating deals, compromises, those kind of things. Again, Dolly Madison and Louisa Adams were very good at this. Rachel Jackson would not have been. And that's why the video talks about how Rachel Jackson may have been a liability for Jackson going into DC politics because of her background and the way she was perceived. It's also worth noting that one of the roles that women will play will be playing uh, a role in, in patronage. Patronage is the giving of government jobs and sometimes contracts. And the women of DC would play a role in kind of putting the right people in the right place at the right time. People like Margaret Bayard Smith, for example, were very good at this kind of networking. She was the leader and part editor of the National Intelligencer, kind of a DC newspaper that was attuned to the gossip of the time period. And she had a knack for putting people who needed to be in the same place or to the point who she thought needed to be in the same place together in the right place at the right time. 
what we're going to see is over the course of Jackson's first term, that role played by women will be replaced by a role played by the party. And we'll see how that breaks down. But I want to give you that background because it's going to be important to understanding, you know, the next part of Jackson's presidency and how Rachel's legacy will play a role here. So some things to watch for here. I want you to look at how Jackson's inaugural, uh, uh, the inaugural ball really signaled a new change in Washington politics. I want you to look for why Jackson's opponents feared his influence. And I want you to look for how Jackson transformed the presidency as part of this. It'll be a big theme for this lesson. And then finally, I want you to look at the Peggy Eaton affair, one of the first big sex scandals in U.S. history and why it was so important to this time period. All right. With that, enjoy. Daniel Webster. When General Jackson comes, he will bring a breeze with him. Which way it will blow, I cannot tell. On March 4th, 1829, Thousands of farmers and tradesmen who had never been to Washington, D.C. before poured into the White House. They had come to celebrate the inauguration of the first president whose life story they could identify with, Andrew Jackson. His whole family is wiped out in the revolution. He's an orphan. Uh, he's angry. Uh, but he decides to make something of himself, and he becomes the president of the United States. It's an extraordinary career. It's what America, we like to think, is all about. To Jackson's working class supporters, their presence at the inauguration celebration was proof that America was entering a far more democratic age. And that was precisely what worried the Washington elite. Prominent socialite Margaret Bayard Smith described how the inauguration party turned into a riot. What a scene we did witness. The majesty of the people disappeared. And a rabble, a mob, was scrambling, fighting, romping. Cut glass and china to the amount of several thousand dollars was broken in the struggle to get the punch. Ladies fainted, men were to be seen with bloody noses, and such a scene of confusion took place as is impossible to describe. Those who got in could not get out by the door again, but had to scramble out of windows. The president, after having been nearly pressed to death and almost suffocated by the people, in their eagerness to shake hands with old Hickory, had to retreat through the back way. The riot deeply alarmed the Washington establishment. As men like Henry Clay saw it, Jackson's motley supporters had demonstrated why the founding fathers had not trusted the masses to choose the president. Now Clay and his allies worried that Jackson, a man famous for his dictatorial disposition, would use the support of this same mindless mob to turn himself into America's first imperial president. It's hard for us to imagine how much that generation worried that a republic could so easily be taken over by a strong man, by a military chieftain, by an emperor. Napoleon, of course, had just recently done that in France. Henry Clay was convinced that King Andrew was the farthest thing from the deliberative statesman that a republic required, that he was, in fact, a dangerous, egomaniacal, potential emperor. President Jackson's plans would only stoke Clay's fears. For over the next eight years, he would attempt to do nothing less than reinvent the presidency. Jackson as president was not unlike Jackson as a general. He was the leader. He thought of himself as a leader. He would, he understood the separation of powers under the Constitution, but nevertheless, he thought that the president had a very particular role as the man who had been elected by all of the people. 
to lead government in a way that no previous president could have even thought of, let alone execute. Jackson's first assault on the Washington establishment was to fire dozens of federal employees, including 13 district attorneys, charging that they were either incompetent or corrupt, or both. Most of these high-level government bureaucrats were regarded as untouchable. Some of them had been there since George Washington's day. Jackson, within a few weeks, fired a number of them. He removed more government officials than all of his predecessors put together. But while the president claimed pure motives for the firings, his opponents took one look at the replacements Jackson hired and proclaimed it the work of the devil. Some of these people were personally unsavory. Uh, some of them had scandals in their backgrounds. And as his opponents, and even Jackson's, some of Jackson's own supporters thought, uh, he was undercutting uh, the competency and efficiency of government by nakedly rewarding uh, people for no virtue other than uh, being willing to say and do anything to get him elected. And so he was turning the United States government into his own personal political machine. But just as Andrew Jackson was starting to look invincible, the Washington elite snared his administration in a sex scandal. Jackson's friend and Secretary of War, John Eaton, had long been friendly with a woman named Peggy O'Neill. Peggy was married to an officer in the Navy, but it was whispered among the ladies of Washington that she was not entirely faithful. In 1829, news arrived that Peggy's husband had died on board a Navy ship. Instead of going into mourning, Peggy almost immediately married John Eaton. And that was when the rumor began racing through the Capitol that the naval officer had committed suicide after finding out that the Secretary of War was having an affair with Peggy. To the ladies of Washington, it was proof that Jackson's depraved rabble was going to sully the cabinet just as it had defiled the White House. The problem with Peggy Eaton, part courtesan, part common tart, is she had a scandalous sexual past. And whenever you see women and sex, in this period, you know it's about fear. And there was a lot of fear in Washington and anxiety about the coming of democracy. The ladies of Washington maybe couldn't do much about that, but they could do something about Margaret Eaton, and they decided to close their doors to her. It was a decision with stunning political consequences. In the Capitol's early years, the social gatherings hosted by politicians' wives were a key venue for Washington's movers and shakers to discuss politics and form alliances. But now, prominent Washington wives, including those of Jackson's other cabinet secretaries, began demanding that their husbands boycott all gatherings to which Peggy Eaton was invited. Suddenly, it became almost impossible to conduct politics in Washington, supposedly because of a single scarlet woman. If you read the press, you would imagine that Margaret Eaton was some Cleopatra or Madame Pompadour. They called Peggy Eaton the doom of the Republic, and they imputed all kinds of power to her that she really didn't have. But what was behind it was not so much fact as this terrible anxiety and fear about this man who could abuse power. And somehow Peggy Eaton symbolized that fear. The simplest way for the president to get Washington functioning again was to tell John Eaton to accept Peggy's social isolation. But for Jackson, the attacks on Peggy were painfully reminiscent of the mudslinging against Rachel. 
The president's wounds from the loss of his wife were still raw. Each night he read from her prayer book and then went to sleep thinking about her. And the more he thought about Rachel, the more determined he became to stop the same thing from happening to Peggy. And so for two years, the president spent more of his time defending Peggy Eaton than on any other matter. For us today, the Eaton Affair can only be compared to Monica Lewinsky, but actually it was even more serious. Because in the end, of course, uh, President Clinton did not lose his office, but as a result of not Margaret Eaton herself, but what she symbolized, the cabinet broke up, which was the first time this had ever happened in United States history, and the last. To put an end to the scandal, John Eaton and the other members of Jackson's cabinet resigned, enabling the president to replace them with men not caught up in the feud. The press lampooned the cabinet secretaries as rats fleeing Jackson's sinking ship. 